with an isomorphism, you, you go two directions, right? So suppose instead, and this is really what a lot of neuroscientists would love to do, I just had a camera running of all the activity going on in your brain, and I wanted to reveal your thoughts. To what extent could I say, oh, firing in sector B, 8615G means Apple, right? To what extent can I say that? Right? And this is actually going to bring forth um, a really important question, which will be the exploration of re the rest of today's lecture, um, is to what extent does, does physical activity have meaning? How do we distinguish between random physical things and pattern physical things? Right? What was it when Galileo was born in church and he looked at the pendulum rocking back and forth and he would use his heartbeats to keep track of the period of the swings. And he noticed that it was always the same. And it didn't even have to do with how big this mass was here, but it seemed completely based on the length. Now, in some ways, what, does, what is the meaning of a, of a swinging pendulum, right? And if I wanted to describe a pendulum to you, I could do a lot, variety of things. Just like I could ask, well, what does the firing in, these, in your brain mean? Ideally, in the future, we'll be able to say, well, that firing, that particular sequence of firings in your brain meant you were thinking about an apple. But what happened, you know, fortunately, a couple hundred years ago is that somebody was looking at this and they realized that they could do better. Instead of just filming the phenomenon, Instead of just saying, OK, well, what happens when a pendulum swings? They're like, well, the best level of description we can do is you know, a streaming 256K video webcam of a pendulum, right? I mean, that's a really bad compression, right, to encode the information. Ah, keyword, information. Fundamentally, what I'm going to argue we're, we're pulling this down to is to what extent is there information in here? And the study of theory of meaning and information theory is going to be our mathematical and rigorous approach to, to what the theory of meaning is. So how much information is in this, right? And what it took was that somebody eventually realized, well, I can, I can describe this, this complex motion, actually rather simply. Well, if I looked at the angle, theta that it makes, I could say, and I apologize to you who haven't had calculus, but when I have a dot above the symbol, I mean, I want to see how quickly it changes with time. So if this were just a single dot, I would mean, what's the kind of just change in time of, of the angle theta? But if I had two dots, I'm, I'm asking, what's the change in time of the change in time of the angle theta? And you can think of this as acceleration, or, or as a single dot would correspond to velocity. I can actually write down the equation of motion of a pendulum as such. Theta double dot plus, and this is just a constant, sine theta equals 0. And, and then if any of you, as you eventually will learn, is that this is too hard to solve as an equation, but instead we express it in a linear form. And don't worry if you don't know what any of these terms mean. Or we approximate sine theta, which some of you have seen in pre-calculus, um, or even geometry, as just theta. Around, around 0, we can approximate sine theta. <laughs> passing to the origin, sorry, as just the linear function of theta. But the point is, don't worry about the mathematics here. I could be talking about any system, and what we'll show you today is that what the project of physics is and what the project of all of science is, is it's reverse engineering, right? All of what Hofstadter has been talking about in chapter 6 has been going one direction. You start with 
a string, and you ask, well, what does it mean? Right? And my answer was that, well, what Apple means is it means the activity in your brain. Or, and then we could say that, well, it actually refers to the physical Apple somewhere out there in the universe, but that becomes a, a difficult problem. But then what about going the reverse way? To what extent does activity in your brain mean this? Is the same question, which Hofstadter doesn't talk about, as to what extent does the motion of a pendulum, you know, just kind of rocking back and forth. Um, let's see, do I have any? There you go. You know, to what extent is the meaning of this motion encoded in these marks on a piece of paper? And this is actually, in some ways, a much harder question, is how do we take the output and code it into the input? And what we're going to be doing today is playing with some active computer simulations and showing to what extent does the output we see on the screen, can we figure out just from that what was the underlying mechanism? And really what all of science and physics has been about is showing that the complicated motions of the entire universe can be explained very shortly using symbols like this. And this is going to get to an idea that we're going to call algorithmic complexity, right? What's beautiful about the pendulum is that it doesn't require a streaming feed all the time to describe its motion. I can write it down in one line of mathematics and give you the complete time evolution of this system. And even with the initial conditions of how fast was I swinging it initially and from what place, I can get to this whirling phenomenon and get all sorts of incredibly complex behavior out of just these marks on a blackboard. And then similarly, when some of you were here two lectures ago, and you looked at the Mandelbrot set, an extremely complex fractal. What if somebody had handed you that and said, tell me what equation produces this? For the most part, you couldn't have done it. What, Lutheran? Isn't like, I mean, equations sort of hiding the information? And because you just look at the equation, but then you get all these stuff that you talked about, but the physical thing is actually in such a way, being sort of connected with the symbols. So you just had this stuff to the symbols. OK, so Latif said, well, isn't all of mathematics just really hiding the information? So, and, and, and what I'm going to kind of do, and correct me if my interpretation of what you said is wrong, um, is that really all we're doing is, is we're taking our mental process, our visual input, and we're, and we're abstracting away the details. We're creating an abstraction barrier between that and this. But I would argue, to an extent, no, right? Um, Although, fundamentally, this sentence is only meaningful to mathematicians, right? And thus, the models they have in their brain. But this actually reveals a very simple relationship of, so what happens when we, when we talk sine theta? How would, how would you parse that? Well, you might draw a circle and then say, OK, if I had a triangle here, I would say that sine theta is opposite over the hypotenuse, right? And the fact that this has a relationship with that involves some serious thinking. But yes, you are masking some of the details. But if you wanted this to run on a computer, it would be much more efficient to just code this up in a programming language than to take a film, right? You, you can do that, but when you like, I don't know if you like find out what those symbols actually stand for, it turns out that you're not really abstracting them too much. You're just making like, these symbols just tend to like the thing so. OK. So Latif's saying that's fundamentally still what we're doing is, is we're, we're saying that we're letting the symbol stand for the thing itself. But I'm still going to argue against you, right? And the reason for that is that there is something unifying behind the looking at the arm swinging in a clock and what I'm doing with this cable. And then as you'll start to study more, and as we'll show today, you know, throwing a rock in a puddle, and then just getting this entire wide